Exclusive on the yeah, 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 yeah. But the thing is, so if God exists, then only one of those religions can be true. Yeah. Because if if more than one was true, then it would mean God is playing joke on us. Yeah, because they're contradictory many times. Yeah, and yeah. once he's revealed exactly, himself yeah. in this religion, yeah. and then he's telling us something else. So I think that's a logical conclusion that only one religion can be. Yeah. So that that is my question. Why do you think, Why do I think? Christianity is oh. true? Oh, okay. You mean personally? You think, um, personally, why I? Yeah, from your point of view. Yeah. I mean, I was brought up Christian, so that's how I became Christian. Okay. But now you're grown up. You have. Yeah, and I can analyze. You I can analyze. You can think critically. Yeah. I'm, I'm assuming. And so. If all the religions are claiming exclusivity, all of the religions claim that their their way of life is a is a right one. Yes? Then how can you say it is Christianity, for example? Why would you why would you consider Christianity to be the true religion of God? Is there any any point within your teaching within Christianity that makes it more credible than any other faith, for example, in the sight of God. Yeah, well, one thing is that you you have to believe it, yeah. Of course, yeah. You have to believe in God, yeah. That is a given in all religions, yeah. Yeah. But then you also have to believe that what the what that religion is teaching is true. Yeah? Again, same in every religion. <laughs> I'm looking for something, something that you can give me that stands out from yeah. other religions. I don't see, if I look at my religion and then I look at the world, how I see it, I can see that everything is consistent. I haven't found anything that would make it that would make my religion inconsistent with the with the surrounding reality. Okay, so let me ask you something. In Christianity, how are you forgiven? Forgiven. How do you atone for the sins in Christianity? Uh, I will speak specifically about Catholic religion. Yeah, of course. In, in I expect you to. You see, yeah, there's yeah. different denominations. Yes. How are you forgiven as a Catholic, let's say? Yeah, God forgives you and in a, in a practical way you, you go to confession where you speak to the priest who we believe represents Christ because he's been appointed uh, the priest by the church. The church that we in turn believe was set up by Christ 2000 years ago. Okay. And because we believe this is the exact church that was set up by Jesus Christ, that's why we then believe that the, if you go to confession in the, in the Catholic Church, mm -hmm. to a Catholic priest. What is the original? What is the original mode of forgiveness of sin? Before you go, oh. before the Catholic Church has existed, before the priest uh, was given your confession, yeah. yes? What is the original method that your church taught you or propagated as the means of forgiveness of your sins? According to the Bible, for example. If I asked you, according to the Bible, how can a Christian be forgiven? And by the way, this is 
regardless of whether you're Catholic, Eastern Orthodox, Protestant, doesn't matter. They all believe this through the blood and sacrifice of Jesus Christ. Yes, exactly. That is the only way you can you can receive atonement of sins. Am I right? Because if you don't believe that, then it doesn't matter what you tell the priest, whatever you confess, if you don't yeah, believe in the original, what do you yeah, say? So that is the key. That's what the confession is based on. Yeah, yeah so your, your key or the central doctrine for forgiveness is the shedding of blood by Jesus Christ. Yeah? Yes, yes, yes. So if you read, for example, in Hebrews chapter 9, verse number 22, it says there is no forgiveness without the shedding of blood. And whose blood is that? Well, in this case, it's Christ's blood, who yes. is a sacrificial lamb. Yeah. Yeah. So human blood, not a lamb, yeah? He's, he's actually a human, right? Even though his title might be a lamb of God, but he's still a human being. Yes, and so we, do you, we believe at the same time he's God as well. Yeah, he's okay, so that makes it, I don't think that makes it any better. Sacrificing God by his own creation, how is that not a contradiction to a God who never dies? You said earlier, you don't see any contradiction in your faith. Whereas yeah. I see I see a clear contradiction right now when you say that Jesus is God yeah. and the only way he can be forgiven is by the death of this God or man God rather, a human being. Yes? How is that not a contradiction? We believe in the Holy Trinity. So Jesus was at the same time being the one of the persons of the Holy Trinity. So he's God the Son. Right. But he was also a human being, like all of us, without the original sin. And that's that's what we believe. So that again we're coming here to the point of belief. Because no, you can either I'm looking you can either believe or yeah. you can I'm looking at the point of a contradiction. In the Bible in 1 Timothy 6.16, God says that He alone is immortal. Yeah. yeah nobody is immortal. What is the meaning of immortal? Someone nice. who does not die. Right? If God right. says clearly that He does not die, and then you told me that He died by His own creation to save mankind, to atone the sins of mankind. Isn't that a contradiction? On one hand, he's saying he's immortal. On the other hand, you're saying the only way you can be saved is by the death of this God. Yeah, this or man God. This would be a contradiction if you didn't believe in the, in the Holy Trinity. Yeah, but we believe that. And it, again, like I said, it's something you can either believe or you can say. No, but the Holy Trinity. If you say. The Holy Trinity. Each person in the Holy Trinity, the Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit. From these three, who is immortal? And who is not immortal? Well, God is immortal, but, but look, Jesus Christ, he raised up, he was raised from the dead, wasn't he? Okay, let's, well, let's, look, at the, let's look at one at a time. Is the Father immortal? Yes. So we got one person from the Trinity, who is immortal, the Father. Is the Holy Spirit immortal? Yes. Okay. Is the Son immortal? As God, yes. But there's something else we believe about Jesus Christ. Because the Holy Trinity is one thing. Okay. And then I, I think it's important to point out that the other thing is that Jesus, when he was living on earth, he was he was man as well as God at the same time. He, That's another contradiction to, I see. He had to If you're both man and God then you can you can be neither. You're you're neither, aren't you? You're either if you're a man, then I can understand you have got the qualities of a man only and nothing to do with qualities of God. If you are a God, then you don't have any weaknesses of a human being, like dying, forgetting, you know, contradicting. Yeah, I can see your point. So I see a contradiction there as well. Yes, I think we're just coming to a problem of believing this or no, not so believing whether whether jesus christ was god and man in the same person or was he not i think that's that's yeah, the but point here, whether you believe this if you do not believe this then i think look believing is okay there's nothing wrong in it but to believe something that is a contradiction that is where the problem is with me so if i asked you are you married you're not if i said that you are a married bachelor would that be a contradiction? 
this would, would be, yes. Would it be okay for me to believe that you are a married bachelor? When I know it's a contradiction. This would be a contradiction, yes. Would, that, this is not, would that be a problem though? Would that yeah. be a problem? Because once you have acknowledged something is a contradiction, and for you to still believe that, wouldn't that be a con wouldn't that be against your principle of not accepting contradictions? Because the truth cannot be contradictory. A truth has to stand out from any internal contradictions. If I see contradiction, if I see contradictions in it, it cannot be the truth. You see what I mean? So when you say he's both man and God then that is a contradiction that's an internal contradiction because when you're both then you're neither just like the married bachelor you can neither be married nor can you be a bachelor and the phrase married bachelor is against the principle of non-contradiction which is a logical fallacy that is correct yeah yeah however like I said, we're coming to it. Yeah, yeah, I think you should have at least one. <laughs> okay. Uh, what was I saying? Yeah, I think we're just coming to the point whether you believe this. No, but believe, look, uh, like I said, it's okay to believe, but once you acknowledge something is a contradiction, and for you to believe that, then that is a fallacy. It is a logical fallacy to accept something that has internal contradictions. For example, do you know that Jesus himself, he never actually claimed that he was God. Yes? So Jesus never claimed, you feel like a celebrity, isn't it? Alhamdulillah. <laughs> so, Just said all I know, so. Yeah, I know, I know. We, we are not uh, here, like I said, to ridicule you or to mock you. We are just discussing from, from a logical perspective. Yeah? Something that we both can agree upon as being logical, consistent and rational. Yeah? Yes. So if, if Jesus during his lifetime, do you believe that Jesus is a really good role model? And what he taught people was the truth? Yes, I do. That's, yeah? that's, that's, do you, Catholic, that's, that's Absolutely. Do you remember the phrase Jesus used? I'm the way, the truth and the life? Yes. Yes? You know, as Muslims, I have no issues with that. Because we as Muslims, we believe that Jesus is a prophet of God, he's a messenger of God, and he's the Messiah. Did you know that? We Muslims, we yes. accept him and acknowledge him as the Messiah, unlike the Jews yeah. who reject him as the Messiah. So you do not believe that he, he rose from the dead, right? No, we don't believe he died at all. So that's another thing that we can deal with. But right now, we're dealing with the statement of Jesus himself. So when Jesus says that he's the truth, then you and I know that he cannot say something which is a contradiction. That's the reason you'll never find an explicit statement in the entire Bible where Jesus claims that he's Almighty God. In fact, he says... Yeah, there is, uh, yeah go on. Yeah, that, that leads me to a, a point I had to make about the Catholic Church. Yeah, sorry, I'm just getting some water. Where's my... Yeah, go on, yeah. Yes, opposed to Protestant denominations of Christianity, yeah. in the Catholic Church we believe that the, the Bible is one source of the revelation, but the other source of the revelation is the tradition of the Church, the way it's been passed on from generation to generation, yeah. starting with the Apostles. Yes, yeah, so we believe that what the Church is doing, the Catholic Church is you're following in the footsteps of the apostles. Yeah, because the apostles were there with Jesus. Yeah, yeah. Not all of them, but yeah, there were so, some self-confessed apostles like Paul, who never met Jesus in his life. No person. You know what I mean? Paul never met Jesus in his life. And he was a Jew. Yeah, but he, he wasn't one of the twelve apostles. Was he? he was not. Yeah. No. But he, there are people who claim that he's an apostle of Jesus of Christ. Okay, but only the sense in the in the twelve apostles that. Okay, uh, that's what you're yeah, yeah. referring to. Okay. Yeah. Fair enough. Anyway, the church is supposed to uh, to take the message from Jesus from yeah. one generation to the next, and that's uh, as an addition to what is in the Bible. Yeah, because yeah? you've got you've Fair got the Bible as, it, as Fair enough, yeah. the way it's written. So you have the way of the Bible. You have the teachings of the Bible and you have the teachings of the Apostles and the Church Fathers and so on. This is what forms the tradition of your yeah, yeah, yeah. Catholic Church. I think it's the same with the Eastern Orthodox as well. Yeah. yeah. But uh, let me ask you this. 
have any of the twelve apostles worshipped a triune God? Or even Jesus Christ? Has I, any one of them I think worshipped God as a trinity? That's why they must have done, because that's... that's no, no, don't, they, don't assume. They, I want to know... How, that's how they... I, I don't want you to speculate. I want you to show me evidence from something that is credible, whether the Bible or let's say the, uh, the sayings of the apostles or something like that. Has any one of them ever worshipped a triune God? I'd say yes. No, they're... don't speculate unless you got evidence. Because what you're saying is, I think maybe, that is not what I'm looking for. I'm not looking for your opinion. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You see what the I mean? Way, yeah, the way I'm saying this is, I believe the church is teaching exactly what the what Jesus was teaching to the apostles and then the apostles... Where is the, the evidence, my the friend? next generation. Where is the evidence? Where did the church get the evidence from any of the apostles or from Jesus Christ or in fact anyone from the Bible? Yeah, that's that's where faith comes in, right? No, no, but look, look. Because if if none... You know, this is... Is Trinity an important part of your faith? Can you be a Christian if you don't believe in the Trinity? No, because that's part of the teaching. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. So it's one of the central doctrines of Christianity, right? Yeah. How can something which is central and core belief and a doctrine not ever be mentioned by anyone in the entire Bible? Think about this. Something which is central to your belief. Without that belief, you would not be a Christian. How can something so important be left out from the 73 books you have, which is more than the Protestants, they only have 66 books, yeah? From all the 73 books it's been left out, why? Isn't that something you need to think about? I'd have to look in all the, all, all the books, but I, like I mentioned, um, there's the Bible and there's the teaching of the church. There's no, but look, the, the, church, the, the church doesn't get... Listen to this. The church gets its information from where? From the teachings of the apostles, like you said. Yeah. Right? Yeah. That's the reason I'm asking you, has any of the apostles ever worshipped a triune God? Have they ever worshipped yeah, the Father, Son and the Holy Spirit as yeah, so God, the, like the way you do? Yeah. yeah, so the point I'm making is that if the church, if we assume, and I believe that, that throughout the, these 2,000 years, the church has been uh, passing on the teaching of the apostles. Yeah. Where is so, this? Where is this so, teaching? That's what I'm asking you. Where is the teachings of the apostles which actually say or they yeah, imply no. that they worship the triune God? Where is this? Yeah, that's what I said about the... Uh, about the two two pillars of our I know I, I know you believe so, so, so look I, I acknowledge that as a Catholic you have to not only just believe in the Bible but also the tradition of the church but then yeah, so, when I asked you does the ch church where the church gets it from you you agree that it gets it from the teachings of the apostles now the teachings of the apostles where are they and which teaching implies that they worship a triune God yes yeah, so the point I'm making is that not everything that the apostles were teaching must have been written down in the in one of the gospels. That's why we have the tradition as the other as the other pillar. Yeah? It's, it's so where did they get the teaching from? Is it orally? Did they get it orally? Yeah, because if you uh, if you look at the gospels when they were written, I think they were written down like 60 or 70 years after Jesus uh, was born. So for that time, before they wrote it down, they must have they must have been passing it on. Orally, yeah, to the to the following generations until they wrote it down. I think that's how it. That's so where is this? Where is this writing? You say they wrote it down eventually. Where is this writing of the apostles? Yeah, it's in the gospel, but they might have not. They missed out the most important thing in your in your faith, the Trinity. Wow. Yeah, I don't I don't think it's the most important. Is it? Is it well, you just told me you can't be a Christian unless you believe in the Trinity. So it is the most important thing. Like in Islam, if anyone says we don't believe in Allah, or we don't believe in Prophet Muhammad sallallahu or we don't believe in the Quran, then they are not Muslims. Yeah, exactly the same thing. Yeah. Okay, so if, so if if no one believes, if a Christian doesn't believe in the Trinity, is he still a Christian? Is he still a Catholic? Yeah, no, because to be, yes or no? To be, to be a Catholic, exactly like you said with, uh, with Islam, you have to believe. Yeah, otherwise they will be anathemized, yeah? Anathema. They will be 
they will be yeah. kicked out of the church. Yes? Exactly. So now the question, once again, if the Trinity is so important, why did the Gospels leave it out? Why did the entire New Testament leave it out? Why did the, even the teaching of the Apostles doesn't contain this? The worship of a triune God. Do you know when the... Let, let, me, let me just help you out here. Do you know when the Trinity was established by the church? When, they, when did they come as a council? Yeah, the ecumenical councils. When did they come together and establish the doctrine of the Trinity? Oh, I don't know the year, you can tell me. Roughly, give me a rough idea. I don't want you to t tell me the exact year. Because yeah. uh, they don't even know the, the, date, the birth date of Jesus, exactly. So I doubt they'll know the, <laughs> the, 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 uh, the date when they have established the Trinity. But it is there in the church writings, yeah. So I'll give you the year. It's the year 325 CE, yeah, the common era. 300, 300 years after Jesus Christ. Okay? Yeah, yeah. There so are, Jesus there was, was long gone. There was some the apostles were long gone. Some of the early church fathers were long gone. And then they had this, you know, there was a kind of a dispute in the church between the Arians and the Athenians. Okay? Yeah. And when the Emperor Constantine, he became the head of the church, sorry, the head of, uh, let's say he became a Christian, or at least he kind of implied that he, he became a Christian. That's when these old councils were then organized. And I think he was even the chair or, or in the head of, of that particular council, the Council of Nicaea in the year 325. So the churches all got together and they, because there was a lot of dispute between the Athenians who said that Jesus was not God, but he was kind of divine, but not exactly God. Yes. And the Athenians said, no, he was God and he's one with the Father. Yes. And so on. So there was a dispute. There was a dispute in early church history when they did not come to an agreement. Yes. So for some years, Athenians, uh, or, um, Sorry, Arian was the head of the church even, or one of the head, uh, one of the fathers of the church, and they accepted him. Then they kicked him out, and then they made Athanasius the main. Uh, they, they they accepted his teaching as the main teaching of the church, and that is when the Trinity was established within the church. I understand. Yeah. yeah? That's, that, yeah that's so this is long after the apostles died. See what I mean? Three hundred years after Jesus, long time after. No, none of them were alive to say, yes, Jesus taught us. And that is the reason now what the Council of Nicaea proclaims as a doctrine is something that all the churches will now agree. They did not give the green light for that. It is the churches who came to the conclusion based on several factors, including political factors. Yes, like um, Emperor Constantine, because he wanted to unite all these people, which is good for the politics, isn't it? If you're divided, then it's not good for politics. It's not good for the for his empire. Empire which is united is better than one that is divided. So there are political factors playing here as well. And that is the reason I'm telling you that if this is a central teaching of Christianity, then surely Jesus would have taught it. You know what Jesus did? He did the exact opposite. Shall I tell you, shall I tell you how? Can I ask you a question? Yeah, of course, yeah. So, didn't Jesus say he was son of God? Yeah, but what does that mean? What is your understanding by the phrase son of God? Because Adam is also called the son of God in the book of, in the gospel of Luke. Yes, David is called the son of God. Abraham is called son of God. There are many sons. You know, like Sheikh Ahmad Didad used to say, there are sons by the tons in the Bible. So what do you exactly or actually mean? by the phrase son of God yeah, the don't forget the context 2000 years ago yeah the second person of the Holy Trinity God the Father God the Son and the Holy Spirit no but what is but, it but what does the term mean what does the term didn't imply the apostles, didn't the apostles call Jesus the son? yeah but like I said there are many sons they call many people as sons of God in fact the peacemakers are called the children of God so if you're a peacemaker then you're a, you're a child of God according to the Bible 
Yeah, yeah. yeah I mean, as people, we might be called children of God. Yeah. yeah. So what's the difference between? What's the difference? Give him, brother. He's got. He's got very few on him. No. <laughs> why do we need so many? Because we They're different cameras. That's why. Yeah. They. They all have their own audio. Yes. Yeah. Oh, you got two. Wow. Yes. Two together. Makes us feel special, now. <laughs> Alhamdulillah. Okay. So yeah, children of God is a phrase yeah. that the Hebrew people used to use at that time, 2,000 years ago, for anyone who is righteous, anyone who is close to God, you know, anyone who was pious, they're called children of God. It's not yeah, yeah. because if I if I said today in English, you are a child of X, immediately you think of biological child. Yeah, yeah. it's a biological relation. So you your parents are your sorry you're, you're the child of your parents so you're the biological child of your parents and this is one way how we understand as a child of someone yeah. what are the other ways what are the other uh, other what do you say uh, way you can interpret this phrase this phrase son of god or son of uh, let's say son of uh, max how will you understand it? yeah so one is a biological son influenced by yeah doing things that this person taught the yeah. whoever we call yeah whoever we call the son so for example you know there's also a phrase in english father of a nation yes yeah set something up is he really a biological father of the entire nation no it's not it is a phrase to establish yeah is a phrase to establish a special relation where people show leadership or authority within the nation Yes. But then, then I think we're going back to whether whether you believe the church or, or not. I think that's no, no. We are we are now interpreting the context of certain phrases that was used in the time of Jesus, or even before him. Like I said, David is called the son of God. Adam is called the son of God in the chapter in the Gospel of Luke. Yeah. So well, for for this, you have to have much deeper knowledge than I do about. Fair enough. About fa Bible fa and, and, fair enough. And, and I mean, I, look. Like I said, how they saw it based on their context, based on their interpretation, based on their culture and tradition, it wasn't a biological So anyone who's called the son of God is not a bio biological son. Like I said, it was someone who was righteous, someone who was pious, and someone who was close to God in his actions. Yes? Jesus, yeah, oh, so Jesus was certainly not a biological son of the Father. Do you agree? Do you agree he's not a biological son? Biological son means the father united, you know, had a relation with yeah, oh, so, Jesus' uh, mother. That's how he was. Yeah, all but I that's was, that's not how it happened. Yeah. It wasn't a biological all meeting. Was, yeah, all I would say that this is, as I believe, the teaching that's been passed on, and I can either yeah. believe that this is the teaching of the of Jesus and the apostles, yeah. or I can say someone invented this. No, no, it's not invented. It's, it's how you interpret it, my friend. It's a matter of interpretation. So there are three. Look, in English, there are three ways in which you will understand the phrase "son of son of someone." Okay. So it's either biological or it's by adoption. So if you adopt a child, then he becomes your son by adoption. The third one is metaphorical. Yes, it's allegoric. That means it's a figure of speech. Yes. So in, in, in many cultures and traditions, like for example, uh, in Asia uh, or even in, uh, in, in, in England. Yes, if somebody says, some older person says to you, my son, I got some news for you. Yeah? Yeah, it doesn't mean you're his son. Exactly, yeah. So that's metaphorical. So you're neither adopted nor biological yeah. son. He sees you as a son, someone that he sees you as likable, you know, someone dear to you. Yes, even he might be a complete stranger, but he sees you as a likable person. He says, my son, I got some news for you. I got something to tell you or something like that, you know? Sure, yeah. yeah. So it's how you interpret it, my yeah. friend. All I can say is coming down to whether we believe the church or not. No, it's yeah. how the, the church interprets it and how the culture of Jesus interprets it. Yeah, but then if you go back to what I said, that church passes on the tradition as well, as yeah. well as the Bible is one source, and then tradition in the sense that uh, not everything was written down, some things have been just passed on orally. Yeah, but even look, for something to pass on orally, you must have some evidence for that even, you know? Like for example, if I asked you, 
Okay, the apostles called home, and how did it pass on? For 300 years or 400 years. Yeah, but that's what I mean about the belief. Yeah, you have to believe that this was passed on. So is it blind belief? Is it blind faith? Because if you don't have any evidence for this passing on, even orally, then it is blind faith. You know, in Islam, we all have the culture and tradition of oral tradition of passing on either the Quran or the uh, the Hadith. You know, the Hadith were written down much later. Yes. But then they were most of them were passed on orally. But then we have a tradition called the chain of narration. Yes? So say for example you passed it on, passed it on to someone else, somebody else passed it to someone else, all the way until those people who compiled these various narrations, all the way from the Prophet through the medium of all these different generations. They have they have even the names and the biography of every individual in the chain. This is how we have evidence of the collection of the Sahih Hadith or the authentic Hadith from the time of the Prophet Muhammad until Bukhari or Muslim or Imam Ahmed in the early days who have written it. So we have a chain of narration. Do you, you Christians don't have such a tradition. You cannot tell me how it was passed on. I mean, you don't even have the names, let alone the biographies. We have these biographies which are preserved in the Church. After Jesus. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, yeah. So how can you rely on something? There's a gap of 500 years between Jesus and the earliest written traditions. See what I mean? We have we have this not only the oral tradition, but we have both the written and the oral. So we have the early manuscripts of the deeds and so on. And we also have the oral way of preservation. We have both. That makes it a strong case for the authenticity and reliability of, of, of these narrations being passed on from one generation to another. Yes, independent attestation by various people in various regions of the world even. Yeah, but yes? again, you have, to, you have to trust whoever wrote it down. So it's blind faith, that's what I'm saying. How do you, how do you know? You know the conversation we're yeah, having right if now? You, if you have a record of... You don't have the writing, that's the thing. Yeah, but that's the point I'm making, you don't I mean, have it written. If you do have a record from a couple of hundred years ago, you still have to believe that whoever put it down why? Years ago. What about the gap of 500 years? How, yeah, how, how would you know that there were... Between saying now in, in, in your case, if you have a record of who passed it on to whom, yeah. you still have to believe that someone didn't make a mistake or maybe... Exactly. You know why we have the record of the biography of each person? It's, it's to ensure that such a thing like a mistake doesn't happen. So imagine this. How they, uh, how they make sure to differentiate between a hadith which is authentic, a narration from the Prophet Muhammad وسلم, which is authentic compared to the one that is not authentic or even weak. So imagine within the chain of narration you have let's say five people. One of the persons within the chain the message was passed on to is someone who is very old and his memory lapses. So he forgets things or he adds things from himself. Yes, not deliberately, but because he forgets because of his age. His memory is not the same as it was when he was young. The people who, who collected the hadith, they look at this as a condition of weakness. So they categorize that as a weak hadith or even they reject it, depending on how the criteria works out in this case. So there was a specific criteria they would they would employ to classify the hadith as authentic, weak, uh, fabricated, and so on. You see what I mean? Yeah, I can see. I can Another see example. Point, yeah, but yeah, you have to. You have to you no, no. Have this to was trust. my friend. This is a rational, logical method of preservation. Yeah, it is not just. Right. It is not just but like oh, I believe, and I, have, I think it's you preserved. You don't have to trust that the people who did it in the past. Yeah. They were acting in good faith, though. If it was only one person, I agree with you. But if you have independent attestation from so many different regions, so many people who didn't know each other, then it is possible for all of them to be right and to have the exact same narration. Impossible, I would say. 
because you heard of this uh, phrase called Chinese whispers yeah you know the the conversation we are having right now yeah if I ask the people who are here who are the witnesses yes a month from today and if they told other people and those other people told some other people yes a month from today if it was passed on much of it would be lost because there's only a few people here yes and then there is no they don't have this stringent method of preservation of the narrations so they don't follow a certain set criteria to preserve these writings even if they go home and write it down if they don't have a criteria they can mess it up within the same way but if you have a standard with which it was preserved like i said then all these independent attestations wouldn't be the same when you when you bring it together as a compilation are you with me such a tradition is not found in any religion yes thank you jazakallah yes uh, you want some water no right. you sure so yeah, what i'll have to be going so. yeah yeah let's wrap it up quickly so here uh, kind of we went on a different tangent about yeah, preservation yeah. but it's quite important you know because you were saying the apostles the tradition was followed by the church and so on but if you don't have independent attestations of eyewitness accounts of all these people then it's impossible like even the we we touched upon the crucifixion of jesus yes how many people were eyewitnesses and how many of these eyewitnesses actually wrote it down as a record of what they saw during the crucifixion this. Yeah, not that, but that, then again, that's that's where the belief comes in. Yeah, you have to you either believe that's true or not. Because you you weren't there, you weren't there, I wasn't there. So, so it's just blind belief then. It's just blind faith. If somebody told somebody told you that they saw a pink elephant flying, they told you this, yeah? Would you believe it? Yeah, but none of us saw God, have we? No, no, no. Hold on, no, hold on. Our testimony, sorry, our faith isn't just based on the fact that we didn't see God. Your and my testimony is based on the people that we trust. In your case, Jesus Christ, the apostles, the church, and so on. In my case, the Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, the companions, and so on. But I gave you the reasoning why Muslims believe not on blind faith, but on independent attestations of the testimony of these people which is preserved in writing and in orally in a very methodot uh, in a specific methodology yeah i can understand. you see what i mean I so we have a specific why, criteria of preservation can, you don't i can understand why this is a good system yeah however it doesn't it has no bearing on the question whether the original message was is true or not it is i'll tell you why between the time of jesus and the 500 years gap which we spoke about earlier of the writings of uh, the gospels and so on yes which we have today which is most of the like i said most of the gospels that you have is in the fourth century and so on so you're talking about three four hundred years after jesus yes yeah, yeah. so the no, gap let, let me make myself clear yeah, yeah if you let's say if you write that you have a very good system of passing it on no no not passing it on preservation yeah okay but then that that doesn't answer the question whether the the message that is being passed on is true or not i think that's a different question right okay so you then you look at the message are there contradictions in the message and in fact this is one of the what do you say one of the acid tests given in the quran allah says in the quran that if this book is from anyone other than allah that means if the quran was from anyone other than god almighty yes then you will find several contradictions in it yes okay. apply that same method of a test yes an acid test on the bible and like i showed you god becoming a man god changing his nature from immortal to mortal god having all knowledge and then when he was asked about the last hour in Mark 13, 32, he says, nobody knows the hour. So again, change of nature. I'll have to go and learn more a bit about theology, then we can have a, another discussion. Yeah, but you know, even if you don't know, you should at least acknowledge the contradictions in it. You see what I mean? You keep mentioning belief, but your belief is based on internal contradictions that is neither rational, nor logical, nor sincere. Because the truth cannot have contradictions in it.
And if Jesus said that he's the truth, then his teachings will never have contradictions in them. If Jesus never said he's God and you believe that he's God, then that is a contradiction. See what I mean? But anyway, I think we discussed uh, for quite a long time. Yes. Have you had a chance to look into Islam? Like the way I read the Bible? Like the way I had scripted no, the I, passages I know, of the Bible? Yeah, I know. Well, it's this, but uh, I haven't analyzed it. Uh, yeah. Would you like a free copy of the Quran if I gave you? Uh, not today, thank you. Is it? I have my faith, yeah. Blind faith? <laughs> it's not blind. It is. It's so far what you have said is we have faith. And every time I asked you, where is the evidence you couldn't provide any? So it's my friend. And trust me, you know, one day we all are going to die. This is a fact. No one yeah. can deny. Yes? Even the atheists won't deny this. Even though they don't believe in God, even they will not deny this fact. Okay? Imagine this on the day of judgment, when God will ask you, why did you believe all these contradictions? When you are a person who employs intellect, is able to identify contradictions using your logical uh, faculties, sorry, the faculties of uh, reasoning that you have, why would you then believe in such blind faith? Then God will tell you, did I not give you enough intellect and reasoning? Yes, for you to use your own reasoning instead of you following your parents or your teachers or your friends or whoever they are or even your church. Why did you not use your God-given intellect to come to the conclusion by yourself rather than just following blindly like a sheep, uh, somebody without any, uh, with, without any research of your own? See what I mean? Yeah. Would you, how will you respond to God on that day? What will you say to God? Hopefully before that happens, I will now have a chance to look into what theology is saying about, about this. Yeah? You've made me want to look into how Catholic theology is answering this, this question. Yeah, but why don't you keep an open mind? Yes, just, you know, if you've got a strong faith, then you shouldn't worry about reading or any other book no I don't I don't worry about that yeah so what is the reason you're not accepting a free gift from us of the Quran do you think you'll convert when you read the Quran sorry do you think you'll you'll become a Muslim by just reading the Quran no I don't think so well there's a possibility <laughs> so what is the fear then what is the fear that you have well I'm a Catholic so I believe my religion is the true religion oh, nobody's telling you not to believe what you believe but I'm all I'm asking is to Keep an open mind to read other other books because, like I said, there's a possibility the truth is in there. Unless and until you com compare and contrast the two, like the way I did, then you can never be yeah, able to conclude was, was which is the truth. It, if I was believing this, then I wouldn't really be believing... Uh, no, no, look, religion. when you read something, do you think I believe in the Bible when I read? Do you think I believe in Christianity when I read the Bible? I don't need to be a Christian to read the Bible. But do you... Do you, do you leave a question, a question mark in your mind? Is my religion the right one or not? You mean if I have a doubt if my religion is the right one or not? After reading so many different religious books, I think it has strengthened my faith in Islam. Yeah, so, so if I ask you the same question, <laughs> how would you respond? It's the same for me. I. You need to read in order for you to and then analyze critically the different books which claim to be from God. And you know, look, there are many religions in the world. I'll, I'll, I'll make it easy for you. How you can, sh how you can shortlist, yes? Instead of reading uh, about thousands of religions, shortlist it to those religions which claim that God is, is one, God is monotheistic. Yes, and I mean pure monotheism. Then you should be able to look at the Abrahamic faith. Yes, all, all these religions claim to be of the Abrahamic faith, Christianity, Judaism, Islam. Yeah. Then you should be able to... Yeah, but then if we, question, if we keep questioning everything, yeah. how are we sure that there is only one God? No, no, we, we know there is only one God because not only logic, but states that there cannot be more than one God who are powerful. I mean, imagine this, you know, in a few hours we are going to have sunset now. Yeah, just imagine a hypothetical question. If there were two gods who are equally powerful, one god says, okay, I want sunset now. 
another god who is equally powerful says no i don't want the sun to set i want it to rise yes who's going to win the argument what will happen to the sun and the earth yeah you see there will be chaos there will be destruction because they are both equally powerful and they won their way see that is what say that both both yourself and I, mm -hmm. we believe that there is one God. We've never seen God to, to see that he's only yeah. one. But you know, Jesus believed there was only one God. But which God did Jesus acknowledge as the only true God? So if you read John 17, 3, the Gospel of John, he says the only true God is the Father. One person, not three persons. Should I believe Jesus or should I believe the church and you who say God is three persons? It's up to you. No, no, it's not up to me. You, you, do you consider Jesus to be higher than the church or the church to be higher than Jesus? Yes, Jesus is the church. Yeah, so who is the higher authority? The church or Jesus? The church's authority comes from Jesus. Yeah? The, the church who is, doesn't, have, doesn't have authority. No, no, who is the higher authority? Who is the head of the church? It's Jesus, yeah. Thank you. But so, church that, yeah, yeah, just to explain, yeah, the church on. doesn't have the authority in the sense that now the Pope can come out and think of something and start saying this as a... Then My friend, that's exactly what happened in the Council of Nicaea. All these different Popes and all these different ecclesiastical churches, all these churches got together and they established the Trinity. Not Jesus Christ, not the Apostles that you talked about. So, clearly, Jesus in the Bible, when he says explicitly in John 7 and 3, if you don't believe me, go home and check it. John 7 and 3, he says, this is eternal life, that they may know you, that you here is the Father, that they may know you, the only true God and Jesus Christ whom you have sent. So, Jesus is telling you that there is only one person who is the Father, according to him, who is the true God. And you know who the Father was in the, in the entire Bible? Or, sorry, at least in the, uh, in the time of Jesus. Jesus, in the same Gospel of John, chapter 20, verse 17 says, you know, he says, I've not yet ascended, he's telling Mary Magdalene, I've not yet, yet ascended to God. Yes, go to my brethren and tell them that I go to my Father and your Father, my God and your God. See what I mean? So he's saying that the Father that he calls the Father is not just his Father. He's also the Father of the believers. And the God of the believers is also his God. Because he says, I go to my God and your God. Do you believe Jesus has a God? Yeah, but there may be... Like there may be what? Being, uh, God being your Father, it may be... No, no, he didn't just say my Father. He says my God. The same Father which he says my Father, he says he's also the Father of the believers. And the Father of the believers is also the God of the believers. And the most important part is the God of Jesus Christ as well. Does the Father have a God? No, but you have to remember that Jesus was God and man at the same yeah. time. So this, this God and man has a God. Did the Father have a God? Did the Holy Spirit have a God? No. Uh, Actually, the Holy Spirit did have a God. Again, in the Gospel of John 14, and I, I think also in 15, it says, the Holy Spirit will not speak, the Spirit will not speak of His own. Yes? So Jesus says that, unless I go, yes, He, the paraclete, will not come. Yes? And He will only say what He hears. From whom? From God. Can you imagine? God can only say and that is God. That is the God of the Holy Spirit. He cannot even He cannot even utter a word without Him being told what to say and when. And the same with Jesus Christ. Jesus Christ says about the teachings. He says, this is not my teaching but of the one who sent me. So the Gospels that have the writings or the words of Jesus Christ are not his words. He says, these are the words of the one who sent me. So Jesus cannot say a word without, the, without his God telling him what to say. The Holy Spirit cannot say unless and until he hears what his God yes, says or he hears from him. He cannot say anything without the permission of the Almighty, which tells you that not only 
they don't have authority to speak of their own but also when when Jesus was asked about the last hour in Mark 13 32 they asked him when is the last hour yes and what did Jesus respond do you remember he said nobody knows the hour yeah okay. gone not the angels in heaven not the son except the father in heaven is the father the son no okay so let me finish just with one no no let me finish this and then you can carry on. Yeah. so the father is the only one who knows the hour not the son not even the holy spirit because jesus says only the father exclusively the father has the knowledge of the hour nobody else and that excludes jesus christ that is a, that excludes the holy spirit that excludes everyone else except the father just like in john 17 3 he says only the father is uh, is the one who is the only true god he says only the father has knowledge of the hour okay. so the knowledge immortality and the only true god belongs all of this belongs only to the father last thing I was, what, what if um, holy trinity is true but it's just something beyond our comprehension because god uh, full comprehension i'm not asking look i as a muslim listen here i as a muslim and in fact anyone who believes in god no one in the right mind will ever say they understand everything about god god doesn't expect us to know everything about him we can only know what he has informed us through his prophets and messengers yes and the one who has been given the knowledge that's my point yeah it's something why would god keep such an important thing a secret on which your salvation depends on would that be fair of god think about yeah, it my friend the reason why why this was written down in the gospel we don't know that yeah no no but that's the thing that's the point i'm making if something is so important for your salvation then it would not be fair for god to conceal it to hide it yes the whole idea of jesus coming for you is to save you and in order to save you you need to be saved by salvation through belief in oh, god of things, what god is all these things are clearly said in the, in the where is the trinity clearly in the bible it's not there yeah maybe not and you can't be saved without believing in the trinity right you can't yeah, because you can't be a catholic you can't be a christian without believing in the trinity yeah, unless, yeah, unless you are a unitarian like christian any other part of the of the, the church is teaching exactly so the other parts of the church is teaching are also have problems in it but the biggest problem is in these two things blood sacrifice without which sorry the human sacrifice without which you cannot be forgiven yes second the trinity without which you cannot be a christian and hence you cannot be saved if god if god loves you and if you love god back then god should have told you explicitly to worship that he manifests as three persons and you should worship these three persons as god but neither jesus nor any prophets in the entire bible old and new testament nor the apostles nor any of the disciples that we know took this knowledge from jesus or any other prophet that they should worship a triune god jesus himself was the best role model and he worshiped only the father and he told other people you know the lost prayer the lord's prayer uh, yeah yeah sure. what is the lord's prayer how does it start our father lord. why does it start with only our father not our trinity or the father son and holy spirit why does it our father hello be thy name what starts yeah. that's what i'm saying the entire lord's prayer doesn't have any of the trinity So that's why I'm telling you my friend every teaching of every prophet and specifically of Jesus Christ it comes only to one person and that is the father and the father was the god of all these people including Jesus Christ yes. so let's leave it there we have different beliefs yeah and I'm talking about your belief my friend I will for Islam if you want to learn about Islam come next time and like I said you have to be open minded you know you have to be able to accept the Quran as a free gift 
So you have another chance now. If you want a free gift of the Quran, I'll give it to you. But I'm not going to impose it on you. Yeah. No, thank you. Thank you for the, no for the discussion today. Yeah, thanks a lot. What's your name once again? Pablo. Pablo, okay. Thanks a lot. You take care. And nice um, nice of you to have this conversation and yeah, for taking you. the time. Thank you. Right? Yeah, yeah, don't don't take the because I think they fetch good prices on eBay, I heard. <laughs> all right, guys, make sure you all subscribe to Dawa Wise. Inshallah, this, this will be on Dawa Wise channel if you want to watch it. Okay? <laughs> all right, I'll just look up Speaker's Corner, Hashim, you'll find it. Okay, thank you very much. Thank you.